Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Ross Sorkin of CNBC and the New York Times, and it is my pleasure uh, to have the finance minister here uh, of India at a very important time uh, in the world uh, and an important time for India, uh, really at a, perhaps an inflection point, uh, which feels like an inflection point. We will find out how much of an inflection point. We are going to break the rules uh, of this particular uh, session, uh, which was originally not intended uh, to include uh, all of you asking questions, but uh, given that there's so many people in the room who I know want a shot on goal, we want to make this as interactive uh, as possible a conversation. So we're going to talk for a little bit, but then we really do want to open it up uh, and allow everybody to, uh, to uh, get involved in this conversation. Uh, so first of all, thank you for being here. Um, you know, I think the big question just to start with is this is a country, um, there are very high expectations now that have been set into motion. Uh, there was a time that this country had GDP of 9%. Realistically, over the next two or three years, what do you think is a realistic uh, GDP number? Where do, where do you think the country's economy could really go? Not a decade from now, but sort of in the very foreseeable future. Well, I think our real potential is 9% plus, and therefore, We'd like to take India in that direction. We've had uh, problems and challenges. We went below 5%, which by Indian standards uh, is a very disappointing rate. Hopefully, we'll do a little better this year. Next year, I think, is going to be significantly better. And if we can continue to take decisions at the pace we are and eventually attract investment into India, I think then India is going to move much faster. And achieving our real potential will then appear to be more realistic. Let me, let me read you something. This is from The Economist uh, magazine. It says that when, when Modi uh, first won, uh, hopes swelled that the new government would adopt economic reforms that had proved beyond the brittle coalitions of the past. Yet in defiance of the maxim that bold steps are best taken early, he has so far not had dramatic change. So cuts to subsidies, such as fuel and fertilizers, which cost uh, GDP 2.3% last year, have been deferred. Uh, there's no firm timetable, uh, the article says, for a uh, national goods and services tax. Uh, India's many states' uh, uh, caps on foreign direct, uh, direct investment in many areas, including supermarkets, remain in place. And the question that the article asks is, is the chance to reshape India's economy slipping away already? I ask it to be provocative. I think you've picked up an economist which must have been a July dateline. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's not in tune with uh, what's happened. Uh, that's not in tune with what's happened in the last six, eight months. Now, what is to be done in a large country like India, almost the size of a continent with the goods and services tax? We've negotiated with the states. A constitutional amendment bill has already been introduced in parliament. It's been broadly welcomed. And in the coming session of parliament next month, I hope to pass that bill. So that's going to be one of the most monumental tax reforms in India since independence. I was asking uh, last evening the secretary of uh, the department which deals with the uh, FDI. He's here. I asked him a question, which are the sectors uh, which are broadly still unreformed as far as attracting international investment is concerned? He's still struggling to prepare a list. And therefore, uh, uh, sectors which were the forbidden areas in India, railways, defense, in the last few months, we've opened up those sectors also. In fact, the criticism is not uh, that Prime Minister Modi did not uh, live up to the expectation. If you pick up the Indian newspapers, the editorials are, why is he going so fast? Why doesn't he want wait for Parliament to pass all the bills and do away uh, then with his reforms? Uh, why is he going by the executive legislation mold, which we call ordinances in India? And therefore, I think this government had a mandate uh, to act fast. And uh, uh, we are moving at a very rapid pace in that direction. Let me ask you about oil prices, because that should have an impact on your economy in a big way. And I imagine sharp declines uh, should be good as a net importer. How much of a boost did the declining oil prices have on the economy? 
Well, the declining oil prices uh, certainly help us in many, many areas. They help us in cutting down subsidies. They help us uh, in our current account deficits. And uh, of course, uh, 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 they help us in bringing down inflation, which we have succeeded. And in India, it's not merely the declining oil prices or the declining commodity prices. Our food prices have also been under control, as a result of which we've been able to uh, uh, maintain a fairly acceptable rate as far as inflation is concerned. Uh, of course, there are areas where uh, they vicariously hurt uh, us, but we are willing to live with them. For instance, uh, most states in India are losing out on revenues, and therefore the regions are a little disturbed, but then they have to live with this realistic situation because the advantages are a bit too many. You're going to announce a budget, I believe, in the next two weeks. And you have to pay for a lot of things that you've uh, talked about um, and, and promised uh, the people. Uh, how do you pay for it? Can you give us a little bit of a sneak peek as to what we should be thinking about? Well, we earn and spend. We've also had a, a, a bad tradition of borrowing and spending. And therefore, since last year, we've uh, raised this debate. In fact, I said it in my first budget speech that uh, how long can India continue to borrow and spend so that we spend today that the next generation is left in debt and they have to raise higher taxes in order to repay that debt. And that is where we started this whole debate on cutting down of or rationalizing the subsidies. I can tell you, elimination of subsidies in India a country where one third of the people are still uh, living in poverty conditions uh, is not possible. It's not even desirable. In fact, the more India grows, the more we have to earn in order to bring those people, pull them out of poverty. But we have to rationalize our subsidies. We, we not only started a debate, and since that was uh, a line from the economist that you mentioned, uh, petrol is now linked to the market, which was subsidized. Diesel has been linked to the market. As far as LPG is concerned, the first subsidy reform has started this month. From the 1st of January, uh, all uh, subsidies with regard to cooking gas now go directly into the bank accounts. So almost uh, 150 million families in India will get them. The next stage, we have to carve out the families who are not entitled to it. And therefore, that will be the reform as far as uh, the cooking gas is concerned. There are, of course, uh, areas where there is a misuse of kerosene subsidy. Kerosene is used both as uh, fuel uh, uh, and also in dark areas in India. But kerosene is also being misused uh, in many areas. So the next area we intend uh, tackling uh, is kerosene. I had appointed uh, in the very first month an expenditure management commission They've only three days ago given me the interim report uh, with regard to rationalizing some of these subsidies. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister last week in a major address on economic issues had said, subsidies for the poor will remain, but we intend rationalizing them. And that's the area where we intend to move in order to cut down uh, some part of the expenditure in order to finance our own activities. We we have targeted a fiscal deficit of 4.1%, but that's not also acceptable as far as we are concerned. We have a roadmap to bring it down to, to below 3% over the next couple of years, and we intend to maintain those targets. What about taxes? Well, we've said that we, we are not a high tax government. And therefore, last year, I almost didn't increase a single tax. We believe in putting more money into the hands of consumers. Therefore, there were three sets of uh, reliefs that I had given in the very first interim budget uh, to small and uh, medium level taxpayers so that they could spend more. Uh, 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 we look at taxes, we are correcting the inverted uh, taxation, which can hurt certain s sections of the industry. But of course, taxes are needed in order to finance the running of the government. Let me ask you about um, corruption. Um, I uh, walked over here on my way to visit with you this morning uh, with the CEO of a multinational company uh, who does business in your country, uh, who's in the middle of building uh, several projects. And he said to me, 
that we just went through the process of 170 different permits to, to do this. And he said, along the way, uh, amidst those 170 permits, I am sure that we have had to uh, pay people and do things that he said, I wish I don't even know about. Uh, whether he does or not, I don't know. How big a problem do you think this is in reality? Well, I can't say that this was not a problem. But let the CEO of the multinational not commit the same mistake as the economist. Because if in last eight months, there's one word which has not been mentioned in India, that's corruption. Nobody's even whispered uh, that uh, there is any allegation as far as corruption is concerned. The whole environment has changed. In fact, every legislative change which we are bringing, whether it's uh, allocation of natural resources, elimination of discretions, grant of environmental permissions uh, which are required, uh, these are almost uh, 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 in the most non-discretionary mechanism. All allocations are through a market mechanism. There's certainly no governmental discretion which is involved. And a major part of the corruption which was alleged against the previous government was in these allocations. So it's the whole system which is now changing. You've been here now in Davos. You have a huge contingent of people here. I know you're looking for more foreign direct investment. What are the, what are the biggest challenges that you hear multinationals saying to you about investing in the country? Well, we have uh, legacy issues. And in terms of legacy issues, uh, 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 I think uh, the two important legacy issues which we have, uh, one is in relation to stability of policy, particularly taxation. Uh, we didn't exactly have the best track record in that. And I think uh, a very adversarial tax policy uh, 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 was counterproductive for India. It scared investment away. Now, we've spent a major part of the last eight months uh, trying to correct that impression. And therefore, systematically, slowly but surely, we are, we, we are, we are reversing the whole policy and coming to a very non-adversarial system. Uh, we've announced that we are not going to resort to the sovereign power of uh, retrospective taxation. We are trying to put a quietus to as many disputes and issues which had arisen. We are uh, setting up mechanisms within the Department of Re Revenue uh, where a lot of these issues could be resolved. We are creating procedures both for international and domestic investors for advanced rulings so they know what their tax liabilities are going to be even before they spend the first dollar. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, we are conscious of this fact. The second fact, uh, we have to ease in the doing of business in India. Uh, the less number of people come to government, that means situation is working well, things are happening on their own. And we don't want people to be rushing to ministerial offices or secretaries for help, that their files or their papers are blocked somewhere. We want to create a mechanism where uh, 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 permission should be granted as a... Uh, at, at the earliest. In this process, we are also trying to solicit the support of the state governments, particularly because uh, the activity is really in the states. And the activity being in the states, uh, it's the states which have to realize that the more they make their uh, uh, procedures simpler, the more they are going to attract and invite investment into their states. And I'm glad we traditionally used to speak of India in terms of cooperative federalism. We've added a new chapter to that debate by saying that it's also competitive federalism. He who makes his procedures simpler will get more money from the investors. So the investors are not going to go into a complicated area. They are going to go into a rather simpler area. And I'm quite glad that uh, state after state is now trying to organize these global summits of investors, trying to invite them into their states trying to offer them additional incentives. Uh, once we are able to create this environment in India, I think uh, uh, the procedures will become simpler. Okay. I want you to speak to one other uh, challenge, if you will, and then I want to open it up uh, to the audience, which is a social issue, but it is something that business people think about a lot, uh, which is sexual violence against women has been a huge issue in the country. Um, what are you doing about it? What do you think it is about the culture why do you think the problem exists the way it does? In fact, uh, 
the Prime Minister, in one of his first major speeches after being elected, that's the Independence Day speech, uh, referred to it as a major point. A lot of people felt that this wasn't a point worth mentioning as an Independence Day speech. And he said, my head, head hangs in shape when I read about uh, these incidents which are happening. And the regrettable part is it's the male members of our own families who are responsible for this behavior. Even during the tenure of the last government, uh, we had been uh, uh, jointly, unanimously able to strengthen laws. But I'm quite conscious of the fact that laws alone are not going to resolve this problem. There has to be a campaign of disgust against this kind of a behavior so that from the very elementary education, uh, uh, people can be trained, educated, almost indoctrinated against this culture of uh, 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 misdemeanors against women of various kinds. And I'm sure it will have, have to be a sustained campaign in India before we are able to uh, rid ourselves of this, this disgraceful scar on our face. I would just follow up uh, with a specific question which relates uh, to the story about Uber which is that you have Uber, the, the taxi uh, limousine service, which you have shut down in part because there was an awful tragic incident uh, related to this. You, do you ever think, uh, do you, could you connect uh, corporate behavior uh, with personal behavior? I don't think they were shut down because of that incident. Uh, there were certain permissions which were required in some states, and they've been asked to comply with the procedures. Uh, uh, the person who was accused of that offense, uh, the police investigation has now uh, uh, revealed that he was a serial offender. And therefore, that serial offender was there even before he was a part of this company. So I think the company's uh, service in some of the states was affected for some time because they required some permissions. But whether uh, this person was misbehaving because he was a company employee, I really can't uh, uh, say that. Okay, let's open it up because I know there's a lot of people in this room who have a lot of questions for you this morning. Um, if you raise your hand, uh, we will, uh, we have some microphones. Go ahead. Uh, Honorable Minister, um, there was a lot of discussion on uh, encouraging manufacturing in India for India and for exports. Um, so I was very curious to know your views on um, Matt, and how you see that uh, perhaps being lowered or what your view is on that and maybe how that could also encourage and incentivize um, and encourage more manufacturing in India. Thank you. Certainly, if I was in a position to get rid of Matt, as uh, many people, particularly in the SEZs, etc., have also been saying, it will help you in lowering the cost. But then I also have a problem of uh, balancing my budget. I can't reduce MAT and then increase income tax because uh, uh, the money has to come from somewhere. And therefore, till such time, we are not in a position to balance our accounts. Uh, uh, for any finance minister to give, uh, withdraw this tax or withdraw this tax is not so easily possible. Uh, in the current year, I may just indicate uh, we made a significant progress as far as our direct taxes are concerned. But when you have a low on manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing taxes uh, collection has suffered. And therefore, it's a great challenge for us to balance our budgets. So unless we are in a position to up the manufacturing so that my uh, overall tax kitty moves up, it's not so easy for any finance minister to then start offering uh, uh, rebates. There's a question in the back over here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. Nelson Cunningham with McClarty Associates in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Modi has really made a uh, substantial effort to turn the page on what had been a period of somewhat scratchy relations between India and the United States. He had a very successful visit to Washington last fall. He's invited President Obama to India uh, for Republic Day this coming Monday. Uh, what is uh, Mr. Modi's vision, your vision, for the relationship between India and the United States? And what outcomes can investors expect from the meetings that will happen on Monday? 
Well, there is, there is a packed agenda as far as Monday is concerned. But I can tell you, uh, uh, I won't describe it as a patchy or a scratchy relationship. Over the last decade and a half, uh, the Indo-US relationship has fairly well stabilized. When we were in government on the last occasion, the relationship, uh, the building process of that relationship had started. And the last UPA government continued to build upon those uh, initial gains that we had. Uh, the advantage of having two major democracies and two large relation, uh, nations in a continuous relationship is that the relationship has matured to an extent that even though we may have differences in some areas, it's not possible to agree on everything, the maturity of the relationship is visible that you, you still can sustain that uh, comfortable ribbon in a relationship. The fact that President Obama is visiting India for a second time in his term, it's the first time that a US president has come to India twice. He's going to be our chief guest on our Republic Day, the first American president to be so. And by negotiation, we are narrowing down the areas of differences and expand the areas of cooperation. So I think it's uh, the relationship between um, India and the United States uh, being a relationship of two very large democracies, as I mentioned, is a relationship around uh, economic and security issues. And it's in these areas that uh, the roadmap for the future of this relationship really lies. Let, let, me, let me follow up and complicate the question. Putin really uh, recently visited uh, New Delhi. How would you describe the relationship between India and Russia? Well, I think India and Russia have been always great friends. And therefore, I see absolutely no contradiction uh, in a country being uh, extremely uh, friendly across the globe with uh, multiple nations. Uh, through historical times and through even our most difficult times, India and Russia have had a great relationship. Uh, uh, Russians have stood by us in our critical times, and I think uh, irrespective of the color or complexion of the government in India, that relationship has been maintained. Uh, we were at one stage uh, very dependent on the Russians for our uh, defense uh, equipment and so on. Today it's uh, a much broader basket, but that relationship still continues. We have a little bit more time to sneak in a couple more questions from the audience. If, uh if we have any. This is a very humble and modest group. Excuse me? Do you have a question? Please. Um, what, what, the other thing we could talk about uh, is immigration policy. Um, and, and one of the questions that I had uh, for you, oddly enough, is what you think of the immigration policy in the United States vis-a-vis -vis so many of the people um, who are coming from India's top talent network. Uh, to work overseas? Well, we've always uh, believed, uh, uh, both in our bilateral relationship and on the multilateral uh, forums, that this is one area where the United States has to open up more. Because uh, human resource Traveling from one part of the world to another is a very important segment of the services sector. And uh, therefore, the more we are able to restrict them, the more our ability to expand both trade and services gets restrictive. The United States uh, has conventionally been a great supporter of the idea of opening out in various areas. And therefore, in consonance with that idea, uh, I think uh, subject to what their own requirements are. The, the, the immigration policy, we'd like it to be liberal. We'd like more Indians everywhere in the world. Let me ask you a different question. When you got this job, when you got this job and you started looking at other countries, I mean, when you started looking at other countries, perhaps, I don't know if you did this, as models, who do you look at right now and go, you know what, I like what they're doing on, on this issue, I like what they're doing on this issue? I, 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 I'm just curious, because I assume when you, you get see, a job like you, this, you start when you, thinking... When you, when you get a job, you see, in India, we've always uh, 
look at the last few decades of missed opportunities, particularly in manufacturing. And therefore, India is a liberal society. We are willing to learn from anywhere in the world. And when you look at manufacturing, a question which every Indian asks himself, what if we had started adopting some of these policies uh, in the 1970s? Would we have kept pace with China? as far as manufacturing is concerned. Today, foremost on the agenda, and that's one of the questions with regard to Matt, which was asked just now, the real answer is uh, we have to learn from economies like that how to improve our core competence as far as low-cost manufacturing is concerned. One of the components may be taxation, but there are several other components which we have to really learn from their experiences. We have to learn from economies uh, which pass through challenging moments, but disciplined themselves, didn't go in for only populism, and within a year or two got out of those crisis situations so that in the long term uh, 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 there was a much greater advantage as far as the country is concerned. Britain did it recently in the last few years, and I think we have to learn from that. How to generate wealth and then let that be scattered with, between your people rather than just uh, distribute existing resources to the people. We have to look up to economies like the United States. And I think uh, Indians, when I mentioned in the last question, travel all over the, uh, the world and become parts of those societies. <laughs> Indians in India are very entrepreneurial. They want to learn from the best experiments in the world. Uh, I think this is what we are really looking at. You've inspired some more questions. We're going to have to uh, cut it off in a second. Now they're giving me the now they're giving me the, the timeline. But why don't we go here? Vivian Reefberg with McKinsey and Company in Washington D.C. If we go back to the discussions with the U.S., what is the one thing that you want to most see change? Well, as I said, uh, economic and security issues are foremost in our mind. I think our economic relationships uh, have been progressing well. Uh, we are also concerned about our region. And our region throws up uh, challenging situations, particularly with regard to security. And we'd like a much greater understanding uh, with the United States with regard to the regional issues as far as India and the region is concerned. I think we have one or two more questions back here and over here. What do we do? My name is Adi Ahmed. Um, my question is on an economic, I mean, financial sector. Um, um, it's actually two folds. Uh, the first fold is that uh, recently there has been an uh, announcement, and of course the spirit is very high for the NRIs to actually invest back in India. So the first question is about the recent uh, uh, licensing procedure on a small bank that recently came up. Uh, but we were very surprised to see that uh, there was a restriction on uh, NRI investment uh, on the sector uh, because 51 percentage needs to be resident Indian ownership companies. On the second fold of my question is, um, at the junction now where there is a lot of need for investment in inf infrastructure, there has been a cap on uh, investment in banks in India, uh, which restrict to on an individual capacity is around 4.99 percentage. Is there a possibility that this limit would be increased? Well, on the eve of the budget, I won't give you an answer in yes or no, <laughs> but uh, I, I'll take your question as a suggestion. Uh, in fact, uh, your, your suggestion with regard to attracting more NRI investments is an issue which is actively under consideration. Yes, sir. Nothing to do with corruption from the resource point of view. Sir, is there a question with this? 
Is there a question? Yes. Okay, good. The question is that uh, we have talked many times about creating some kind of a mechanism which allows us to enforce contracts or some kind of a mechanism that allows us to go to a body that can help in uh, right. enforcing a contract. And we don't seem to have that, like arbitration, for example. We seem to end up with everything round of litigation, right. third round of litigation, and people get tired. And the only other alternative right. is if you can clone a couple of Amitas and send them around, then it might help. I think uh, you, 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 you have a valid point. And you have a valid point for two good reasons. In contractual matters, the rule is enforcement and not breach. And if there is breach, the legal system has to undertake to enforce. Unfortunately, we are still governed by our old concept that in the event of a breach, the rule is damages and not enforcement. Now, I think that's become obsolete. I had requested the Law Commission in 2003-2004 to reconsider it. And they did submit a report. I've again requested the Law Commission to reconsider it, though that's directly not under me. And uh, I would personally like to push, uh, I've been, uh, it's, a, it's a part of my own conviction that in 2015 you can't come out uh, with an obsolete law uh, that if you built an airport and there's a breach, then go into arbitration and take damages or go and file a civil suit and take damages, then the, op then the answer has to be to enforce. The second, as far as Arbitration Act is concerned, when we replaced the Arbitration Act in 1996, uh, the way it's been um, interpreted by courts, uh, there is too frequent an intervention. On basis of the Law Commission's recommendations, some corrections have been made. I think some further improvements are required, which is being worked out. And uh, uh, so that it becomes completely internationally compatible. Uh, that's under consideration, and I hopefully in this coming session, they'll be introduced in Parliament. Right. Okay. Um, I, I apologize, but we, uh, we are out of time. Uh, I wish we could. We can try to do it after. I want to thank everybody for your questions. I want to thank the Finance Minister for this candid conversation. Uh, on behalf of uh, all of us, we wish, uh, we wish India very, very well, and we, uh, we hope that uh, all of the things that uh, you hope happen, we do too. So thank you.